Good morning. Good morning, Chris. How are you? Good. Good. All right, so I need to make you a host. I guess so. <laughs> okay. Which means that you're going to have to start recording. Really? Yeah, sorry. Sorry. I'm just going to. I know. Well, I, I'll be right back. I'm just going to close the door. Hang on one sec. Good morning. We're going to start at nine o'clock. Oh, let me see. Did you make me a host already? Yeah. Okay. Yep. I can share my screen. Perfect. Good morning. Who's, who's the other person? Who's Everest? Don't know. So how was your morning? Our, our mastermind was canceled this morning too, by the way. Oh, was it? Okay. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, I'm not there. I just, you know, couldn't Every, have it. Everything falls apart when you're not there. That's it. <laughs> the earth revolves around me. <laughs> that is correct. That's you are all, so right. All that counts. That's right. That is right. Uh. Ready for the day? It's Friday. I am. I'm so excited. Three day weekend. I'm really happy. I'm really happy about this weekend. I'm gonna try to get some gardening done. So Yeah. Well yeah. it was supposed to it was a little drizzly this morning, but now it's now nice and sunny, so I don't know. Yeah. I it I think it definitely rained early this morning. I'm driving in was really crazy. You know, over Mar Park, it was just really super dark clouds, and it was weird. Yeah. What are you going to do this weekend? Do you have plans? No, nope, nothing. Just going to take a set up pictures for a list that I got in Granada Hills on Monday. Nice. And that's about it. Nice. So. So Ms. Desai is coming to you today. Yes. He is. It's always nice to see the guys, so. Eh, I don't know what that's like since we're out here. Sa Sam pops by every so often <laughs> when he goes to all Valley Escrow upstairs. Uh, he did that day at that meeting. <laughs> Yes. <laughs> yes. So are you in the Valencia office or is that the office that you're located in Valencia or where are you? Ah, who knows? I'm in some movie theater right now that's showing Century 21 on the screen. Um, <laughs> yes, you are. I, I, it's called the Santa Clarita office, but mm -hmm. it is in the Valencia is not a city, so it's in Valencia, but. Um, yeah, your area just confuses me. Yeah, it's, it's Valencia sort of a, I don't know if Westlake has anything like that, but they have different. Oh, is it like Wood Ranch in Simi yeah. Valley? Okay. Yeah, where Wood okay. Ranch is not actually a city, but right. everyone knows where Wood Ranch is. Yeah. Got it. Yeah, so Santa Clarita is the city, but it, it's comprised of Saugus, New Hall, Canyon Country, San Stevenson Ranch, and Valencia. So nice. Yep. Yep, we're right across the street from the mall and the sheriff station. So we were right in the middle of all the protests when we were having them. 
Yeah, I don't know where the mall lives. So I quest you from our office. Obviously, which, uh, where I, you know. You got to come out here. You got to see I know. I will. I will. You got to make a trip out here. I will. I'm thinking, I'm hoping to do that. Actually. Have you seen all the other offices? Have you been to all the other ones? No, I've only driven by, uh, well, you know, Ventura, when I had jury duty, saw that. Um, okay. Just saw it. Um, but other than that, no. I, and I think the Oxnard office, I've actually been in when it was Troop. Now who ran, was that the Janet's office or Janet was Camarillo? Camarillo. And I've definitely, okay. I've been in Camarillo. So I've been to Camarillo, I've been to Ventura, mm -hmm. I've been to Santa Paula, been to Wood Ranch, been to Westlake, never seen Hollywood Beach, never seen um, Oxnard, I guess I've never seen. I used to go to the uh, Ventura office when I was a uh, mediator for the Ventura court system. Oh, gosh. So it's right down the street. Yeah, it is. Right down the street. Yep. Okay, so let's see who we have five people. Good so morning, Patty, Andy, Cindy, got Andy, and Patty. Got Cindy. Good morning. Good morning. Any Good question? Morning. Any questions from the early birds while we're getting ready to start? <laughs> Not so far. So Fred's going to pretty much um, spearhead today's meeting. Uh, yeah, Chris, Chris is uh, leaving me alone here. She's going to trust me. But I have to record it, so we'll see. <laughs> You'll be fine. I thought of a question. Okay. <laughs> How is Karen? She's great. Um, uh, she is, she's doing well, just recovery is a, taking a lot longer than she or anybody else has expected. Um, she is still on oxygen. It's only at 1%. Um, she's waiting for, uh, her portable oxygen. Uh, you know, the little Inogens, you see the infomercials where it looks like a handbag almost. Oh, yeah. So yeah, so she's yeah. waiting for delivery of that, which will help her mobility. And I think once she, she's able to be more mobile, um, she'll be able to uh, feel a little better with regards to because she's right now she's so limited. So yeah. So because of uh, the severity of her respiratory I guess, infection, you know, due to her being asthmatic with the COVID, it, it's really taken a toll. And uh, so it's just, it's going to take a little bit longer than she, than she certainly wants. Believe me, she's chomping at the bit to get back. But yeah, every time that she, as an example, you know, she was pretty active last week and um, it really threw her off. So she's now, you know, battling with the whole exhaustion and, and things like that. So, okay. but thank you for asking. She's, she's okay. doing good. So. Okay. Keep her in my prayers. Please. Yep. Yep. Okay. Not, I know. Oh my gosh, somebody <laughs> say a joke. It's killing me. Jeez. Okay. Oh, this camera's driving me really crazy. I just these cameras are just insane. It's weird. I'm, it's like I'm looking at it, but it looks like I'm looking down. So that's a skill we gotta learn. <sighs> How to look at the camera and look at everyone on the screen at the same time. Oh please. This whole thing's just the whole camera thing. <laughs> okay. All right, mister. Nine o'clock. Yeah, give it to 902. We were waiting for Gabby, so when she gets in, we're ready to go. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, we it's the three minute rule. We always wait three minutes for uh, stragglers. 
Oh, is that the Zoom rule? Yes, that's, oh, that's okay. the Zoom rule. Oh my goodness. Okay, goodness. Gabby's still trying to get in. All right. She is in, so I guess we can start. Let me hit the record before I start talking. There we go. Good morning, everyone. Today is number five of our classes on contracts. Today we're going to tackle all the miscellaneous contracts that we haven't done in the other ones. Any questions from the other four sessions that anyone has before we start? All right. And let me share my screen and away we go. Okay, so today we are going to start with the market conditions advisory. This has to be given whenever we have a purchase or a listing to the client. Basically, it tells you, and it, it was interesting because I was rereading this today, and it's basically our market. You know, it's impossible to predict future market conditions in a competitive hot real estate market, which we are in right now. You know, there are generally more buyers and sellers. So it basically just says that, you know, sales prices, offering price. You know, who determines the offering price? The offering price is determined by the buyer. All we can do is suggest comps to justify or give them an idea of what price to do it. But we would never say, hey, I think you should offer X amount of dollars. And the reason is, is because if they don't get it, then you go, wow, I would have offered more, but you told me to offer X. Or if they do get it and they overpaid, then they go, oh, I wouldn't have paid as much. So again, it's the buyer who needs to come up with the price. We just have to guide them to what the market is showing and where we think their offer would be accepted. Um, Non-contingent offers, we are getting more of those. You know, either they're shortening contingencies or removing contingencies. You know, be very careful when you do this. Make sure you understand the risks. You know, if the buyer can't get the loan, you know, if they're not satisfied with the property condition, if you remove your inspection contingencies, you know, I know you, everyone wants to make their offer the most appealing, but again, we don't have to have one. We don't want to be in somewhere where now we have an issue that we don't like the property or there's an issue we found with the property and we have no recourse to get out. So be very careful when you remove contingencies, even when you shorten contingencies, if you shorten appraisal or lender contingencies, talk to the lender to make sure you're able to do that. You know, talks about the loan contingency. Loan contingency is 21 days unless it is changed. Appraisal is 17 days unless it is changed. Inspection is 17 days. Again, this is the inspection time. This is when your buyer can do any inspection they want as long as it's not evasive to make certain that this is the property they want to buy and if they know all the conditions of the property. There may be issues with it and your buyer may be fine and that's okay. If they're not, there's a request for repairs form which we're going to talk about later on. You know, broker recommendations. You know, we do not recommend you write a non-contingent offer. You know, we, we recommend you review all of the seller's reports. We recommend you do professional inspections. You know, again, this is a very difficult market, but again, you still need to be prudent and protect your buyer's interest. Multiple offers, there are going to be multiple offers. I've seen, you know, every, anywhere from 10 offers to 30 offers. Again, are they given multiple counters? In the beginning, they were. Now I'm seeing no. Now they're just going with the best offer. They're not wasting their time going back for a second round. 
So again, seller needs, you know, when they're reviewing it, the seller needs to review everything, make sure they have the sales data to make sure they priced it right and look at all the offers. And again, the highest offer is not always the best offer. The best offer is the offer that is going to close. Notice to of unforeseen coronavirus circumstances. This only comes into play if when you wrote the purchase agreement, you included what's called the CVA, which is coronavirus addendum. And that was talked about, you know, in the prior class. If you do that, then if something happens, you can use the coronavirus notice of unforeseen circumstances to get out. Is it loan related, the reason you need to get out? You know, loss of income, notary, you know, we couldn't get a notary to sign the loan docs. We couldn't get a notary to sign a quick claim deed, you know, lender delay. A lot of this stuff was prevalent when we first started. Now, I don't see this as much anymore. I mean, there may be little delays, but not so much for coronavirus, more for a lot of refis and lenders have taken long. The only time I've seen the coronavirus is when we need to get something from a city or a state or federal, their offices are delayed and then that causes an issue trying to get certain things. Hey Fred, yeah. I have a question. So sure. for loan related, so we had an, um, an instance where the buyers actually contracted COVID and okay. were hospitalized and they were not able to sign loan docs. Okay. So it would be, this form would be applicable then. This form would be applicable since they are not able to sign the loan docs. You know, now the question is, do they want to cancel or do they just want to do an extension until they're able to move forward? Okay. I mean, we've had both where, you know, all of a sudden they got COVID and they realized, you know, maybe this is not the right thing to be doing right now. We should be doing something else and they want to get out of the deal. Mm -hmm. um, stay at home order. Um, we don't have a stay at home order right now. We were, you know, but again, during a stay at home order, if you couldn't do a pest inspection, a home inspection, you know, couldn't get movers. Again, this was more prevalent in the beginning, not so much now. This is what I was talking about, personal impact. You know, a government ordered quarantine, physical, physician ordered quarantine, like Chris was saying, you know, they have COVID, they can't be out, they can't, they're in the hospital, COVID-19 related hospitalization. So this is where that would apply that either they can delay close of escrow or cancel the contract. But again, you needed to have the CVA done initially for this stuff to be implemented. And in, and in today's market, I don't see a lot of CVAs being initiated at the beginning. Initiated with the offer, with Correct. the initial offer. Right, because after that, there's nothing that says they have to agree to it. I mean, they don't have to agree to it even with, when they get the offer. But now it's even less if you're already in a contract and now you're giving me a CVA. It's like, uh, you know, sorry, we're not, not really going. So I have a question regarding compliance wise. Wouldn't it be, I guess, prudent for everyone to initiate the CVA with the purchase agreement? I mean, it would, but does that make your offer less attractive than other offers? Possibly, but it's, it's a fact that we're dealing with. I'm just, I'm just asking. No, I, and I know, and, and I have this discussion, you know, on other things too is yes, we're protecting our buyer for compliance reasons, mm -hmm. but uh, then we also inhibited them from potentially getting the offer because the three other offers don't have a CVA attached to it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, so like, you know, me and Kathleen always talk about, I'm going to tell you exactly what's right, but then you got to figure out what's best for the circumstance for the deal, as long as you stay within the lines. Right. Yeah, so yes, the CBA would be absolutely right to do, but is it the best to get your office accepted? Don't know. Oh, especially in this market. Right. Okay. So that's the issue. Water conservation, plumber fixtures, and carbon monoxide detector notice. So civil so law says now, California law, that all water 
um, faucets, shower heads, toilets have to be low flow and water conservation. Also, we also need carbon monoxide detectors in each location. So again, this is a not a point of sale unless you're in LA City, but it is just a notification. And on the SPQ and TDS, there's a question, do you know if you have it? It's a yes or no question. So this point, it's just more informational. Going forward, it's probably going to become a requirement just like LA City, where you have a retrofit inspection. You know, water conserver and plumbing features, um, carbon monoxide detectors. How many people know where the carbon monoxide detectors should be and how many do we need? You know, we need one on every hallway where there are bedrooms. We don't need it in each bedroom, but we need it on the hallway where there are bedrooms. So if you have a ranch style house where you have bedrooms on both sides of the floor, you're gonna need a carbon monoxide detector on, on both sides. And you also need one in the general living area, family room, kitchen, that area. So you need at least a minimum of two carbon monoxide detectors. And this would be called out by home inspectors and appraisers. And if it's called out by an appraisal, they're gonna have to come back and do it again. And that's another $150 hit for the buyer. Local requirements, like we said, LA City has a retrofit requirement where these things have to be in place. And you actually have to have an inspection done prior. Request for repairs. This is my favorite. Okay. <laughs> so this is, this is, it's my favorite for two reasons. It's the, mis the most misunderstood form around. First of all, you do your inspection. You find issues, now you write the request for repair. You send your request for repair in and you never hear, you never hear anything. Legally, the seller never needs to respond to your request for repairs. They don't have to say yes, they don't have to say no, they don't have to say we even got it. So that's one issue which causes a lot of complaints. I've never seen that happen. Most sellers will respond and say yes or no. But the other thing that comes up is this is not a contingency. The contingency is your inspections. So if you've done your inspections and now you're at 17 days and you're still working on your request for repairs, the seller can give you a notice to perform to remove your inspection contingency. Exactly. And that's where a lot of issues happen. Wait a minute, we're still working on repairs. Well, that's great. But again, it's not the contingency. There is no contingency for requests for repairs to be resolved. So first of all, it is number one. And numbering is always an issue with people because if you see a number two, escrow, everyone else is gonna say, well, where's number one? Date prepared, just like every other document, is only a reference to this document. That's the only meaning it has. When was this document prepared? Now, so we're asking the buyer, the seller, to do something. So the first thing we can ask them to do is fix whatever we found wrong in the inspection report. So what we do is we start typing here and you go, oh my God, it's not gonna fit. Oh, let me go do an addendum to list everything else. Incorrect. And we're gonna talk about addendum amendment later on. What we need to do is either attach a list here or, and you gotta take my word for this because it is magic and no one ever sees it. If you keep typing, it will actually create what's called a text overflow. You will never see this text overflow unless you print, but it is there, I promise you. And I will attest to that because I did not believe that. And I literally made Fred sit on a Zoom call while I was doing it and because I just, I didn't believe him and he proved me wrong. So yes. So you if you type it here, on typing. it'll keep going and it'll be a nice text overflow mm -hmm. referencing this. Everyone's happy. They can sign it. They don't, you don't want to do an addendum or an addendum because what's going to happen is People are going to sign the addendum, and the way the addendum is written, it says, I'm agreeing to whatever's on this addendum. Right. 
and they may not be agreeing to all those things. So that is why it becomes an issue of how it's done. So the correct way is either if you are a visual person and you really want to see something, you attach a list and this could just be a word document, just dated signatures on the bottom or initials or take my word, type it in, have a text overflow. No addendums, please. So the other text yeah. overflow. Yes. Um, what does that mean? Like if you, if you just need more space, then it just yes. auto gives you more space. If yes. you keep typing, you'll it'll give you more keep blanks. Typing, it'll keep, no, it won't give you more blanks. It's actually going to create a form that's called the text overflow document. And you won't oh, see okay. it. You, you won't, won't see, you won't see yeah. it, but it's going to be when you save this document on your zip forms, it'll be the, there. the text overflow, um, document will automatically be auto-populated within your file under zip forms. So this takes a lot of faith. So you got to believe it. If you, <laughs> if you don't have faith, it, it does. use the list. Okay. That's all I could say. I've put it, it to the test. test. Yes. So it does work. Yes. Try, try it one time. See, see what it looks like. And, and it's really nicely done. It's actually a form. It'll say, you know, this is in reference to request for repairs number one. Mm -hmm. So it's a really nicely tied together. So the other section is B. Section one and section two for termite work that we have found. So if you've done a pest report or you were given a pest report and there's any section one or section two work that you would like done, this is where you would place it. Not up here, over here. This is specifically for section one and section two. Section one, is definitely for FHA is required and VA section two is definitely for VA loans required. Section one is active infestation, visible termites. Section two is something that's happened in the past and there's evidence there, but it's not active right now. So it depends what your client wants to do, but if it's FHA, you need clearance. If it's a conventional, this is negotiable what you want to do for it. On the section two also for VA loans specifically, um, for something that has happened in the past, it's typically water stains, water damage. Right. And it could be the bottom of a cabinet under a kitchen sink or a bathroom sink. Yeah. So if the inspector calls that out, that has to be repaired. Great. For VA. VA. That's correct. So, okay. Now the other thing is we could say, hey, you know what? This is great. It's a lot of repairs. I'm a handyman. I like to do it myself. I want to do it. You could ask for money instead. Okay. You could ask for a credit. Two things. One, you still need to justify why I'm asking for X amount of dollars. So in here you would say, you know, issue number 22 on the Oxford home report, ask for credit, you know, not for them to fix it. And here you would put a dollar amount that you would, be satisfied or your buyer would be satisfied, we'll fix the issues. Two th one thing, this credit cannot be higher than closing costs. Credits could only be given towards closing costs. The buyer is not going to get a check for $5,000. They are going to get a reduction of their closing costs for $5,000. So some buyers may think they're getting something Oh, great. I'm going to get the 5,000. I go buy new carpet. No, they're not going to physically get anything. It's going to be a reduction that they don't have to pay. So it has to be equal or less than closing costs. Second thing, having it in this document is great. Everyone agrees to it. The lender never sees this document. So for lender and escrow to know there is a credit, we are going to need an addendum to say now, we are given a credit of $5,000 to recurrent and non-recurrent closing costs. That's the only thing the lender can see. We don't want to say we're given a credit to fix the sink. We don't want to see a credit to fix anything. Credit, recurrent, non-recurrent closing costs. Now, so, what happened? Oh, yes, good. I have a question. So regarding the, the credit. You know you can't leave, okay? So. <laughs> Just tell John we're busy. <laughs> 
So, okay, so say you have your, you have all your inspections, you have your sewer line inspection, your property inspection, your termite inspection. And um, you, the buyer's like, well, it's gonna cost a total of $5,000. I'd rather just get the money, you know, credit from the seller and we'll handle the work after the close of escrow, what have you. Correct. So at that point, would you not agree that it's worth a phone call to the lender to see if that credited amount, the proposed credited amount would be applicable yes, before you I would, submit it. I would always talk to the lender to see what closing costs are. Okay. So this way you have a dollar amount. So okay. let's go along Chris's lines. And, and we had one house like this where the credit was above closing costs. Right. So there's two ways we could handle that. Well, there's only one way you can handle it. One, you have a closing cost credit. And the second, we can reduce the purchase price for the, so it comes up to be the exact dollar amount. So let's say it's $10,000. You can have a $5,000 credit at closing cost and a $5,000 reduction in purchase price. So the buyer is still getting their 10,000 just split up so we can be within the contract. All of this so, needs to be verified with the lender. For the dollar amount of closing, yes, yes, yeah, you can always reduce the purchase price, no problem with the lender. Wow. So, but the only thing is, the the selling agent, the listing agent, may have an issue because now it reduces their commission. So, but that's a whole nother story. But there is different ways. If it's a extensive amount and the seller's not willing to do anything, talk to your manager, talk to compliance. There's always ways to figure out to make the deal happen. What would you consider to be an extensive amount? Anything that goes over closing costs. No, I mean like, okay, so would you say like a double digit? So say well, the closing- I mean, I, I've, seen, I've seen double digits where it was enough for closing costs. So th this, was actually, this was actually a $15,000 fix because they needed you know, slab work and all that. Right. So we actually had to reduce the price because the closing costs wouldn't have been there. Okay. So, but yeah, but again, it's, there are ways to get things happen. Unless the buyer says, hey, this is just too much work. I don't want to do anything. Then, you know, that's fine. You just cancel the deal and you move on to something else. But if, if they want to work with it, there's ways to work with, they will repair some, credit some, repair none, credit all, work it out to make the deal happen. Right. Then whatever we give, if we're doing a pseudo-lateral, if we're doing a home inspection, if we're doing a termite, include a copy of all the reports here. You know, label it, dated, you know, report dated, blah, blah. So this way we have a reference back to say, okay, this is what substance, you know, gave substance to these issues that we have found. Exactly. So now the seller gets all this and they have choices to make. Number one, I love the easiest one. Seller agrees to all the buyer's request. And then the buyer removes the physical inspection contingency. Buyer removes those contingencies identified in the CR. So it's either you can give them a CR and say, I want you to remove buy, you know, inspection and appraisal if it's that timeline, or just the you know, inspection contingency. Or the seller does not agree to any of the buyer's requests. Or the seller says, you know what? I agree to some of it. I don't agree to other things. So I'm going to send you what's called the pirate's request, the RRRR. So <laughs> this way, I will tell you what I'm going to fix and what I'm not going to fix. Okay. So you got a question? Nope. Okay. Yes. <laughs> Of course, I have a question. So, um, so with regards to investigations, the your yeah. investigations of the property, I just want to reiterate: if you're representing the buyer, investigations of the property is not only the physical inspection and you know uh, yeah. anything that needs to do with the home, but it's also the insurability of the home. So, and insurability, yeah. all the disclosures, you've reviewed the everything, title, HOA documents, everything. That's what your inspection period is for. Okay. 
Um, so, excuse me, can I ask a question? Of course. Yes, please. Um, on the seller's response, you can check both the I and the double I, correct? Well, the seller agrees and yes. If you check, if, if it's just the physical inspection or the seller going to give everything. you a credit or, or a contingency removal, which we talk about, right. that has more than just a physical inspection. Right. So you can, when it's over, it's over. You can do both. You know, and everything and their contingen contingencies are over. Yes. Correct. Okay. Thank you. Yep. So now if the seller agrees to all the buyer's requests, buyer here of my removes the physical inspection and those identified in attached CR. So again, if the seller checks the first box, then the buyer needs to agree down here and we're all happy and we move on. Let's say the seller didn't agree to anything or agrees to some things. So they're gonna do a request, a seller's response to buyer's reply to request for repairs. And this is number, come on somebody, tell me, shout it out. What number? One. One, One. yes, it is the first. R, 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 R. So some people put two thinking, well, that was number one. Now this is number two. No, this is number one. And this is referencing request number one dated. You remember that? That's the only reason that date is there is to identify the document. And now the seller said, okay, I agree to all the buyer's requests except repair number two or except whatever specific, you know, not going to replace the AC unit, but I agree to everything else. Okay. Or I'm not going to give you a close of escrow 5,000. I'm going to give you a close of escrow 2,000, or I'm going to reduce the price to 500,000 instead of 495, what you wanted. So it's, it could be a multiple of things. I could do everything except this. I could give you a credit. I can reduce the price or something else altogether. Okay. Now, now the seller agreement only applies if one, after we agree all this, this removes in writing the physical inspection or again, the contingency removal. So the seller sends this off, comes back to the buyer. Buyer now has options and this can go back and forth multiple times. You know, Buyer could say, I agree everything, that's great. Let's close escrow, move on. So buyer says, nope, I accept your response with the following modification. You know, I don't want a full AC replacement. I'd like it just to be tuned up and checked. Let's do that. Or I'm gonna start from scratch, get rid of this, my first request for repairs and move on. And then the buyer signs this. Now the seller says, okay, I agree with that, or no, I do not agree with it, and please submit me a new request for repairs. So we go back to the beginning. So two questions. One, what number is this now, second time around? Two. It is two. It's your second request. Mm -hmm. Unlike, unlike um, counter offers, this is not, doesn't build on each other. So Everything that happened in one is gone. It's history. It doesn't exist. So you've got to start all over with whatever you want. So it's not like a counter offer where I agree to one and two, but not three. Okay, now I'll do number three here. So now we put all the counter offers together and we have a contract. Each request for repair stands on its own. So whatever went on with number one is gone. And if we're up to number two, you got to start the whole process over, figure out what you're going to put in there and go on. And then they can do our number two and keeps it all going until we come to some resolution. Hey, Fred, on the seller's yeah. response in the middle of the page, I just want to point out where it specifically states right, right there, any credit, yeah. right? When the seller responds. So see here, guys, where it says any credit included in the paragraph, it specifically tells you that you're attaching an addendum. And that's the addendum where you're going to say, seller agrees to credit buyer 
non uh, recurring and not and or non recurring closing costs in the right. amount of Correct, because we never want the, the lender to know about any requests for repairs or any issues with the house. Now, this is a side question, and I don't know, we have some new agents on this phone call? I believe we do. Okay. Does everyone know the difference between recurrent and non-recurring closing costs? Um, no, and also I want to know why you don't want the lender to see it or escrow to see this document. Okay. Because if escrow sees a document, they can provide it to the lender. So the only thing that escrow is going to see is the actual amendment for the credit. Okay. The difference between recurring and non-recurring closing costs. Recurring closing costs are property taxes, home insurance, stuff that the buyer pays up front, but it's always going to recur for the buyer. Non-recurrent is one-time fees. So if we just say non-recurrent, you may not have enough non-recurring costs, but if we include the property taxes and the homeowner's insurance and any HOA that needs to be you know, kept back, we may be able to meet the credit. So that's why I always include recurrent and non-recurrent. Also work with your lender if it's, I mean, again, this was back when interest rates were higher, but if you had extra money as a credit, you could always buy down the interest rate right. to increase your closing costs to help the buyer. But you know, in today's 2%, 3% you know, market, there's not much way to buy down anything. So, but again, this is market change. So I'm, what I'm saying is for the future, think about that. Okay, this is the biggest, issue we've had, you know, for a while. What is the difference between an amendment and an addendum? Previous to about, oh, I'd say a year, year and a half ago, we never had an amendment. All we had was addendums. Okay. An addendum is adding to the contract. An amendment is changing something in the contract. Okay. So if we're changing something that's already agreed to in the contract, we need an amendment. Okay. So let's say we're changing who's paying for the home warranty. Okay. That's in the contract saying buyer or seller is paying for the home warranty. Now we've agreed to change that. So we need an amendment stating who's going to pay for the home warranty. So that is going to change the contract. Also the other difference between an amendment and an addendum, an amendment has a time limit, just like the purchase contract, just like everything else. It has a three day time limit. After that, it doesn't exist anymore. And it has to be agreed by both parties for it to be enforceable. So change in contract, time limit, everyone needs to agree to it. Okay. Addendum add in to the contract. Okay. So we're going to add something to the contract. You know, we're going to add now, Oh, we're going to leave the refrigerator. Okay. So that's now an addition to the contract, anything like that, that we're adding. There is no, or where I've seen a lot is used in the TDS where we've written a TDS, but we fat, forgot to do something. So we're going to add something now, or we're going to update the TDS with something that has happened. This has bitten us in the butt once, okay? If you are doing an amendment to the TDS, okay, you need to make sure that every time you give that, let's say this deal falls through, you go to the next deal, make sure you give the TDS with any addendum or amendments, okay? Because otherwise, and this happened in a deal we had, the TDS went out, the addendum didn't, something was disclosed in the addendum that should have been, buyers never knew about it because they never got it, big issue. So if you're gonna do it for this deal, do an amendment or an addendum to change it, then if this deal falls apart, update your TDS. So all you gotta do is remember to give one piece of paper instead of now you gotta Remember to give a whole stack 
to make sure everything works. And this one, people have to agree to it, but there's nothing that says you, you, you know, reject it. There's no time limit. So that's the difference between an addendum and an amendment. Contingency removals. This is also a fun one. So again, whatever number it is, number one, number two, what are we, where is this tied to? Is it purchase? If it's tied to the purchase agreement or if it's one of the requests for repairs like we talked about, or if it's tied to an amendment that we are doing, okay? What are we removing, okay? So here we are only gonna check the ones that we are removing. Are we removing loan? Are we removing appraisal? Are we removing inspection? What inspection? Physical, all inspections. Are we removing the HOA disclosures? Are we saying we've got the reports and disclosures, we're fine? Are we saying, yes, we're okay with the title report? You know, so it breaks down, this is where you're gonna use it if you're removing just a specific or multiple contingencies. So make sure you, whatever you're checking is the one you're removing, okay? If you're only removing a physical inspection, check that. If you're moving all of the inspections, check this. So let's say you did your physical inspection, but you haven't got the HOA docs or anything else, don't check all buyer investigations, okay? Only check what you are removing. Here is where we're saying, here we're going in the opposite direction. We're removing everything except a loan or appraisal or contingency for sale or HOA. So this is, we're removing everything except something. This is, we're only removing these things and we're keeping everything else. So there's two ways to go depending on what you're removing. If you're checking most of these boxes, check B and then just check the boxes of ones you wanna keep. Or C, we're done, we're removing everything. So and then the, by removing, yeah. I'm sorry. So by once, what happens when everything is good and you remove all of the contingencies? When you, everything is good and you remove all contingencies, you now have no recourse to get your earnest money deposit back if you cancel the deal, unless the seller did not give you a completed TDS in a timely manner, and then you would have five days after you receive a completed TDS, completely filled out, and the seller's avid. Yeah, I just want to. I just wanted to point out the importance of that. So yep. when you remove your your when you remove all of your contingencies, just be sure that you really do are able to remove all of the contingencies. And also, here's a big, 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 big. If you have a contingency for the sale of your property, mm. okay, do not collect all contingencies because now you just removed that. You've made your buyers homeless. Correct. Okay. So if you have a contingency for sale, which in theory should not be removed until you close escrow, then you would check this and leave this still intact, okay? If you check this, or if you sign and agree to any addendum or amendment saying buyer releases all contingencies, that also does the same thing. So be very careful when you do those type of things, because I've seen sellers, you know, not maliciously, but just slip in, hey, buyer removes all contingencies. Well, no, I still have my seller contingency. I still have the contingency that I need to qualify for the solar lease. I mean, there are still some out of the fringe contingencies that you really got to be careful about. Okay, we have a question. All right. All right. No uh, question. <laughs> Would you wait to remove inspection contingency until you receive the completed seller TDS and SPQ? Y yes. Yes. Because, again... The physical inspection is one part. The reports is another part. So if they removed the, if you've done your physical inspection, but you haven't got your reports, then don't remove that contingency. Now, I, I'm going to tell you, you know, every real estate agent has two hats. 
the seller, the buyer. So if I'm the buyer, I'm not removing my contingencies until I'm dragging and screaming and, and giving the notice to perform because I'm protecting my buyer all the way through. If I'm the seller, I'm giving that notice to perform on day 17 to make sure I'm following the contract. So it all depends. Now, there's been a new caveat thrown in the mix. If you write an offer on a Zillow property, okay? I just heard about this the other day. Zillow has their own forms that they use. Zillow has what's called passive removal of contingencies. This used to be big when we were doing short sales and REOs. The difference between a passive removal and an active removal. Passive removal is I do nothing. Day 17 comes and that contingency is gone unless I ask for an extension and I'm given an extension. Active contingency removal is these contingencies are in place until I actively submit a contingency removal. Okay, big difference. A lot of people don't see it. A lot of people don't read the contracts. A passive means on day 17, you're done. Whether you agree to it, not agree to it, you didn't send anything, your contingency is removed. So be very careful when you are dealing with contracts that are not CAR contracts. There are more and more out there when we deal with Reloads, when we deal with Zillow, and other companies are now coming up with their own contracts. So make sure you review it, make sure your manager reviews it, make sure compliance reviews it, make sure everyone reviews it because there are a lot of hidden things in these contracts. Verification of property. Boy, we got all the good ones. Oh, another question, Chris. Uh, let's see. I don't see anything in the chat box. Oh, I just saw the chat box flash. Oh, okay. Why is it? Oh, why is it that they get to use their own contracts and not comply with ours? Um, I guess for Zillow. Yes. Again, there's nothing that says anyone needs to use CAR documents as long as the documents are done to their legal specifications. But Zillow is now their own brokerage. They have. They're going to begin their own agents. They have their own listings. So they are requiring, just like when we do reloads, reload requires us to use certain documents that they have. Same thing here, Zillow is requiring us to use certain documents that they have. So just be very careful what these documents are because I can tell you frontwards, backwards, and sideways what the CAR documents do and how they protect you and all that. I have no idea about a Zillow document or any document that's been created by someone else unless you really look at it and read all the issues. And so, I guess uh, for sale by owner, they, I guess, theoretically could use their own documents as well. They're, they don't yeah. have access to CAR because yeah, they, CAR is really just for licensed realtors. Um, oh, CAR is for, exactly, realtors, not licensed real estate agents. Correct. So that's the Zillow big difference. Is a realtor now, they've joined NAR. Yes, Zillow has joined NAR, but they're still not going to use our documents. Is there any way we can get a copy of their documents so we can start uh, dissecting them? I am trying to on some of their listings. They, they post their documents. Um, once I get some that I, I can validate that are true documents, I'll you know look at them and hand them out so we can look at it and see where the issues are. And can you do a class on them? I don't do classes, sorry. <laughs> Like this. Oh, this, this is class? Oh, <laughs> oh my gosh. So, but uh, Zillow, uh, this... well, just, just ask Chris. This is not a class. This is a show. Oh Sorry. my gosh. Okay. He's so funny. So, but this whole thing with Zillow just happened, though. It's very recent. So, yes. I, and, okay. and it's happening quicker than you think because okay, they so just we... bought showing time now, also. Yes, I just saw that on in the news. So, um, the question is, can we just not accept Zillow forms? As long as you don't want that listing. If your buyer doesn't want to write an offer, that's fine. What about? I mean, we, we cannot require the seller to use any specific forms. 
What do you mean? So we can't tell, let's say Zillow is representing the seller. Right. So we can't say we'd love to write an offer, but we want to use our forms. And the seller says, nope, I want you to use Zillow forms. So then you have the choice, just like with Red X, uh, not Red X, um, not Redmond, there was another company out there. Rex? Rex, yes, with Rex. You know, you want their listing, you got to use, you know, you don't get any commission, you don't get anything, you got to use there. So the question is, you know, are you looking out for your buyer? You know, it, it becomes a, a big issue. It's already a big issue. It's going to become a bigger issue as they, as they start getting, right now they have, right now they have agreements with um, John Hart. John Hart's representing a lot of their listings, but eventually they're going to have their own agents. They're going to belong to their boards, just like, you know, Ventura County and, can they see me and all that? So they're becoming a full fledged brokerage. So it's just something to be aware of. Again, business is business. You know, all this is auxiliary noise out there. We just keep doing what we're doing. Let, let us help you guide us, you know, guide you through this. But don't go, oh my God, Zillow's in the business now. What am I going to do? I'm never going to get another listing again. No. You know, we've had distractors all throughout, you know, everyone's career here from, you know, help you sells to, you know, I buyers and all that. It's, it's all out there. You just do what you're doing and you'll be fine. And just keep attending my classes or shows and you'll know everything about it. <laughs> so we have lots of questions now. <laughs> Whoops. Well, I think it's more comments. Um, so Patty was sharing that Zillow had purchased Showing Time for five hundred million. Yes. And then. Um, now, now do you know? Well, I won't get into why they did it. Go ahead. Okay. And then, who who at the boards ever thought it was a good idea to release proprietary info to Zillow in the first place? Why did they do that? To make money. And um, it was funny because because we sold them stuff, and then the agents had to buy back their leads. So it, yeah. So what does Zillow's purchase of showing time mean? Basically, what they're trying to—I mean, they they bought it for two reasons. One, they love information. Zillow loves information. I, I was at a CAR meeting the other day for three hours of just data, data, data. I mean, they they're slicing, you know. Zillow owns, um, Zillow also owns um, Dot Loop. Okay, so I mean they're just getting information from everything to see what buyer habits are, what seller habits are. They're accumulating all this information. So by them buying Showing Time, right now they're agreeing to let us still use it, but if they shut it off. And they, it becomes a proprietary thing of Zillow that, hey, you could schedule your showings online only for a Zillow listing as opposed to any listing, you know, that, that might be a direction they're going in. Because more and more people are starting to use show in time mm -hmm. to set up their listings. Mm -hmm. So. Okay. okay. VP, verification of property. Another misunderstood uh, document. This is not a new inspection. This is not a time to find problems with the property. This is not a time to do new inspections or anything. All this is doing is saying, is the property, two things, in the same condition when I made my offer and have they repaired everything that I've asked them to repair? That is basically the scope of this document. This is to be done five days before close of escrow. We do not recommend waiving it. We do not recommend the agent doing it and not having the buyer do it. But this is basically saying, walking through the property, yes, everything's in the same condition. Two, yes, they've done the repairs we've asked. I've had buyers say, well, wait a minute. I want to wait till they move out to do my VP. That's not going to happen. They are probably not going to move out until the close of escrow the day before, or maybe even the day after, depending if you have a 
you know, close of escrow plus whatever. So you've got to look at the property. If everything looks good and you, there were no comments here, you just say, you know, nothing noted, all the buyer needs to sign. If you find issues, you need to write them down and then the seller needs to sign it. Not that they're agreeing to do anything. They're just saying, okay, you have now made me aware of these issues. So now you have to decide what you want to do. Do you want to hold up funding? Do you want to hold up recording? Do you want to deal with this after the close of escrow? What do you want to do? So basically it's just saying, I found these issues. I'm now making you aware. You know, let's say they didn't, you know, the sink still leaks. Okay. Sink not repaired. Okay. I've made you aware of this issue. I'm the green, not that I'm fixing anything, but I'm green. You've made me aware of the issue. Then the question is, how do you want to proceed? If after they close and all that, you move in and now you find there's this big hole where the sofa used to be, that's now a civil issue that you need to go after. So, you know, and that's where, I mean, I, I've seen a few of those where it's happened, but not, you know, an ordinate amount where now we got to figure out what to do. So just be aware, this is just verification, same condition, you know, grass looks the same, the walls look the same, everything's the same, and they did any repairs that was supposed to be done. That actually happened to me. Um, um, VP was fine, did our final walkthrough, everybody's friendly, exchange keys, blah, blah, blah. The sellers move out, and they had a curio cabinet against a small wall, but there was a big hole in that wall that the curio cabinet had was covering. I didn't see it. I wasn't moving a curio cabinet during an AVID. It wasn't called out during an inspection because the inspector's not doing that. Yep. So that was um, that was something that we approached the seller after. How did that resolve? It resolved with the seller not wanting to do anything. Um, it was like a, a too bad type of situation. And so I had it repaired. At your cost? At my cost, it was it was minimum. Okay. But yeah, and that, you know, sure. when things like that happen, it's unfortunate because um, there's just people like that. But um, yeah, I mean, it was just it was under a hundred bucks. No big deal. And that reminds me, I, I went to a, a legal seminar way back when, and the guy said, "Okay, if you are here to figure out how to win your lawsuit, you're in the wrong place. <laughs> Once you are sued." you've lost. You've lost time. You lost money. You've just lost. The key is sell it before it gets to the lawsuit. Money fixes everything. Yeah. Okay. Just like Chris. I mean, they could have fought over it and all that hundred yeah. bucks. Everyone's happy. Chris has got a new buyer who thinks she's the greatest person in the world. She moves on. Think about the long term. Just no, don't stick your feet in the ground. Oh, no, sorry. This is a seller's fault. I'm not doing anything. Look at the big picture, guys. Yeah. Okay. Money always fixes everything. And I think, and there's a lot of, well, here's another issue. So, um, you know, I, it could be all based on principle where, you know, you're just, no, that's their fault. They lied, blah, blah, blah. But it really, I think it determines on the severity of the issue and the, and the projected cost. how much money it's going to take. The projected cost, exactly. Yeah. So, yeah. So, just like I say, when, when you come up with issues, when you come up with requests for repairs and all that, think about it, talk about it, structure how you can make the deal happen. Not just well, I'm right. This is the way it needs to be. I'm sorry. They need to fix that. That's great. But if your buyers really love the property and they want to move on and be happy, let's figure out how to make it happen. And I think we have actually under an hour today. So Are we really done? Have, yes. Oh my goodness gracious. I know we're having so much fun. Oh dear. So, okay. okay. You got Any to come up with another form. <laughs> I don't have plans till 11. <laughs> Hey, hold on. I got a whole book of forms. Oh my gosh. No, you just made him do his happy. A whole book of forms. Let's, he's going to start doing through. his happy dance because, you know, he's like the form god. Oh my gosh. 
he was so excited to attend a car event going over forms and how long was that that was like three flipping hours yep oh, oh the best one was a data one that was really good that was interesting <laughs> it was it was interesting to see how they extracted the data from you know all our contracts see look at his um, eyes his and, eyes yeah, they're gleaming yeah. he's so excited yeah. <laughs> That's why this is not a class. This is more of a show. I enjoy this. So I'll ask a question then. Sure. Um, and it's one that I, I should have asked. No, you ago, ask any question you want. You should have asked yeah. it on Monday. Why wasn't no, it? No, don't be silly. Um, uh, this was dealing with the, um, the form with the specific verbiage about uh, pest uh, pest inspections. Okay. Um, you know, there's two, there was an A and a B for the pest inspections or something. Oh, right. Okay. So up, up, it, it's actually on the request for repairs and, and section one and section two. Yeah. Chris said something about uh, the way I understood it anyway, about that's usually something about water damage. On section okay. two. Yes. So, Fred, do you want to pull that up? So, when you get a termite inspection report, the, the pest control company, it's, it's invasive. Um, not invasive like a property inspection, but it is invasive to the point where they're looking under every single sink in the garage, they go up in the attic. So, I mean, they really are looking at every nick and cranny of the home. So section one, where, uh, where it says BI, section one, that is typically if there's any type of active infestation of termites or um, evidence of termites, it could be um, subterranean termites where you see the actual little mud things on the wall, which is really disgusting, uh, or um, dry rot on any type of eaves or window sills around the home. So that's always considered section one. If it's very severe that on the report, on a termite inspection report, it'll state the home may need to be fumigated and the woodwork needs to be repaired. So on section two, uh, where it says BI, uh, BII, section two. So that is really referencing any type of water damage or significant stains. And those typically happen underneath kitchen sinks and bathroom sinks where you, we all have some type of loose pipe or backups or what have you. So as an example, when I sell my home, I, I have an automatic um, soap dispenser that's built into my sink. Well, we tried filling it up once and the whole dispenser fell off. So I have an actual soap stain on the bottom of my cabinet that looks like a water stain, but it's a soap stain. And I know for a fact, if I ever sell my home, that's gonna be called out. So that's one of the things that I'm gonna to have to fix before I list my home. And whoever helps me list my home, God help you. Right. <laughs> Dealing so, with my husband. So that water damage is not as a result of the pests, correct? But it was discovered while inspecting for pests, correct? And this could okay. also be around uh, window sills as well. So, and okay. the corner of the home, um, like a flooring, if there was any type of flooding for whatever reason, um, any type of discoloration, and that Got could it. be from okay. uh, floor to ceiling. Great, thank you. You're welcome. Yeah, was, I'm actually trying to <laughs> get a uh, termite report that I have that shows section two. But, yeah, so, and, and if you have a VA loan, you're gonna have to fix section one and section two. Yeah. FHA, you gotta fix section one. Conventional, it's negotiable. And that's why I never put the termite report in the contract because if it's in the contract, the lender can have access to it and go, wait a minute, there's section one and section two I want it fixed. So. And 
The reason why that we don't put it inside the contract on the residential purchase agreement saying seller to do all of the section one work or provide us a termite report or anything like that is because it's written within the agreement within the signed agreement so that signed agreement is going to the lender and escrow company right everybody signed and you're opening escrow but if you receive a termite report because you've asked for one that's been written in the agreement the lender already knows that he's, you know, something out there needs is pending still. And if there's actual work that needs to be done, could be fumigation, dry rot, whatever, you are not able to close that loan, obtain loan documents, anything, until you receive a clear termite report from that past company. And that means it has to be done before close of escrow. Before close of escrow. And the seller has to pay for it because I never recommend the buyer pay in for anything before close of escrow because they could fix a house and then not own it. Right. So, so it's very important not to include, uh, we used to, you know, say, well, seller's going to pay for everything. Yeah. Pay for the termite report or what have you, but it's become a very big issue yep. and obtaining a certificate, a completion of certificate, a certificate of completion rather, um, depending on the, on the pest control company, it can take a while. It sounds easy. I mean, how hard is it to, you know, issue a certificate of completion, right? I've had one that I had to wait almost a week and a half for that damn thing. So it was. And, it, yeah. Then also, if you have a handy owner who says, oh, yeah, I can replace that beam, no problem. The termite company may not give you a certification because they don't know what was behind that beam or anything like that. So unless they do the work, you may have an issue. And they actually, so if you have a person, a seller, who's like, yeah, I can do it, no problem. That termite company who pointed out that issue must come back to the property and inspect that work. Yep. And if it doesn't meet their standards, they will not issue a completion, a certificate of completion. Sure. Because they're guaranteeing the, um, the home to be pest-free for one do however many years that their company offers by using their service. And, yeah, and yes, that's a good tip, Kristen. We should yes, always very good tip. schedule ahead of time because these days everyone is slammed. So, and you only have 17 days to do your inspection mm -hmm. or less, unless you remove contingencies. So Mike wants to know, would it be better to do a pest inspection but not provide it for your it in the RPA? I prefer it not to be in the RPA. It's only a $95 inspection. Um, as a seller, they could do it before, yeah. just so they know what they're gonna be hit with, or if the, yeah. as the buyer, just spend the 95 bucks and get an inspection from a termite inspector that you know and trust. Um, just to give you an example, I was at one listing that the buyer had their inspector, the seller had their inspector, and we came up with different results. Yes. You know, one found issues, one didn't find issues. So, right. you know. I had, a, yeah, my example is that I had a seller who used um, a very well-known commercial person, right, Terminex, and uh, stated there was nothing wrong with the property. And during inspections, the buyer took it upon themselves because they had every right to, to, to have another pest control company come in along with their property inspector. There were subterranean termites in, in the garage. And it was evident. So you just need to be careful. So yes, I would not include it in the RPA at all. Any other questions about today's contracts? Any contracts? Anything? Okay, so Mike wants to know, would you advise doing a pre-listing pest inspection for your sellers? Yes. I, I had a, um, in fact, I did everything prior to listing my client's home. We did a property inspection and we did it like six months before she was ready to list her home because uh, she elderly, COVID, we were still in lockdown and we were not, you know, she was just concerned about that. And, and so um, we just wanted to make sure 
we knew what we were dealing with. Minor issues came up on, and uh, minor issues came up on the home inspection and with the termite company, dry rot, eaves needed to be replaced, which were done. And uh, we did have a certificate of completion to give to the buyers at the close of escrow. And everything that was done in the property inspection was done by a licensed handyman, which we had receipts for. So when we received the, the offer, the, that buyer, I supplied all of that information to the agent, letting them know that, that that's what we did. And uh, it was still up to them whether or not they wanted to do their own inspection. And, you know, they had every right to, but uh, knock on wood, every, everybody was good. And, and just on the other side is when the buyer, when the seller gives me inspections, I always advise my clients to do their own inspections because if they find, let's say they accept your inspections that you've done from the seller, everything's great. Close of escrow, something comes up. You have no recourse against the inspector because you did not have the contract with the inspector. So it's always good to have your own inspector. So this way, if there is issues, you have some recourse and where to go. Yeah, I think the most important thing is that, of course, we want to protect our sellers and, and buyers. Yeah. And you can definitely do a pre-listing inspection. And, and for buyers, just recommend that they take the time that they're allowed within that contract to do the inspection, not to take everything at base value. They have every single right you know, to take advantage of, of the time and, and do it thoroughly. And on a side note, if you do do a pre-inspection with your seller, make sure whatever is found is in the TDS. And even if you've corrected it, put it in a TDS saying it's been corrected. Mm -hmm. So, because now you know of issues that you didn't know of before. See, aren't you guys excited? Have we scared the bejeebies out of you? <laughs> Just so you know, we are always here. Me, Chris, your managers yeah. are always here. For any questions, any issues, come to us. Between you know all of us, we have years of experience. We'll figure it out. Yeah, it, everything is you know negotiable, and there's always solutions to everything. And it's just don't do not have a knee jerk reaction. Just yeah. take a step back. We'll just figure it out. Yep. There you go. All right, we'll my let friends. You know the next time around. And, yes, uh, thank you so much for hanging out with us this past week. And uh, we're always available if you guys have any questions. All right. All right. Have a good one. Okay, have a have good, a good one. Thank you. Thank you.